competition in the skies has never been tougher, and the stakes have never been higher. Competitors make us better. BA has to provide a better service. But now, in its centenary year, the company is setting off on a journey of its own. It's going to arrive a bit early. Earlier, the better. To transform itself back into the world-class airline it once was. Everything has changed, apart from our salt and pepper. It's a tough world now in aviation, so we need to move on. As British Airways begins its multi-billion pound makeover, our cameras have been allowed exclusive access to all areas of the business. From the factories where the airline buys its state-of-the-art jets... I just think aeroplanes are beautiful. The aircraft can't fly until we've, we've completed this process. ..to the engineers who keep them in the air. When you're working on a plane that weighs 300 tonnes, there's going to be problems as we go through. If you can play an Xbox, you can push out a plane. From trouble at the top... I get pissed off when people criticise VA. If someone criticises VA, they're criticising me. ..to the teams on the ground... One of the machines has broken down. Do you know how to turn this off? I can't turn it off. ..and the people who keep the passengers smiling. If we don't deliver, the airline doesn't deliver. In this episode, can the airline's crack team of engineers fix a hangar full of faulty aircraft in just one night? There's always a danger that we might have cancellations, and we absolutely don't want that. The remote-controlled robots helping to shift 60-ton planes, provided they do as they're told. <laughs> Run a little wide there, Sarah. <laughs> and a race against time. Will Sally Ann get the 787 fueled, loaded and ready to depart on schedule? We need, please, some toilet rolls and some soap. There's no soap on board. Every day, the airline is responsible for around 800 flights in and out of its UK airports. Making sure these planes depart safely and on time is vital. Punctuality is crucial for any airline operating anywhere. Those that are obsessed with punctuality, they measure in seconds. They know that if they um, position a particular vehicle in a particular way, they're going to get an extra 40 seconds. I've been part of these conversations because 40 seconds on every flight, on every departure, 800 times a day, makes a huge difference. So every second counts. A recent survey saw BA place 10th in the world for punctuality, with almost 80% of flights leaving or arriving within 15 minutes of the scheduled time and the airline is determined to improve these figures. Crucial to this is their army of ADMs, or aircraft dispatch managers, whose job it is to ensure that arriving flights are disembarked, refueled, cleaned, and then reloaded with passengers, luggage and cargo without causing any delay. Bravo Kilo Romeo, which is coming in as the 142 and going out as the 005. Sally Ann Ellis is one of 200 ADMs employed by the airline at Heathrow. She's responsible for making sure that everything gets done properly, safely and on schedule. I will be managing the activities at the aircraft side and uh, managing those that come anywhere near the aircraft, so there's quite a lot involved in it all. Today, Sally Ann is responsible for flight BA-142 arriving from Delhi, but in just a few hours this plane becomes flight BA-5, so Sally Ann has her work cut out and already there's a problem. Unfortunately, it's slightly delayed, so we might have a few passengers that are missing connections and so on and so forth. As well as this, Sally Ann has just found out that on board are a large number of passengers who require extra help. We have 34 wheelchair customers coming in too. It could potentially cause a problem if we haven't got enough wheelchair providers. Right. With just a few minutes left before the flight arrives, Sally Ann's next job is to make sure that the area outside the gate is clear and safe. Looking for any sort of bits that could be ingested into the engine, uh, you know, any sort of hazards, really. I'm happy. I just want to check we've got someone to cover these lights. How are you? I'm all right. Are you going to do the lights for me, darling? If I switch yeah, them on. Yeah, switch them on. Yeah. Yeah. OK, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Right. I'm just activating the guidance lights. If you look up here, you've got the 787900, and as the aircraft pulls on stand, that will count down the metres for the captain, so when it gets to zero, it will tell him to stop. It will also guide him just to make sure he's on the stand straight. With such a complicated job, getting things to run smoothly isn't always easy. It can be very unpredictable. You think that you've got everything button down and then you only need one thing to go wrong. You never really can tell. At 9.50 and 20 minutes behind schedule, flight BA-142 finally arrives. 
Now it's up to Sally and the team to try and make up for lost time. Our aim is to get these jetties on within a couple of minutes, especially if this one's late. Knock on the door so they know. Hello, how are you? Coming up, some surprising news threatens Sally Ann's schedule. Customer service manager didn't tell me when he opened the door, so that may delay them coming off. How these mechanical marvels keep the planes flying at the touch of a button. Ah, uh, oh. almost <laughs> made it. Almost. <laughs> And with seven planes to fix, are the engineering team about to blow it? That's what they test it. Just come off on the end. As well as their long haul fleet, the airline runs a short haul operation 140 smaller aircraft that fly on routes of five hours or less. Some of these planes can make three or four different flights every day, so sticking to the schedule is vitally important. Beyond safety, the number one consideration is how can we coordinate that departure and that arrival in a way that we can make it even more efficient. If you're going to travel to a meeting and you're going to travel for an hour, for two hours, you really need to be getting there on time. But aircraft are complex machines, and any technical issues can cause havoc with the schedule. The airline has a highly skilled team of engineers who operate through the night to make sure the full complement of short-haul aircraft are available each and every morning. We are a casualty environment. We, we don't want any aircraft here. We want them all ready to fly for our customers. This is the fleet support unit based at Heathrow Airport. Every evening, the overnight team of skilled engineers learn how many aircraft need repairing and when they're needed back in the air. We have a meeting before each shift where it's the day shift handing over to us exactly all the aircraft that we've got to work tonight, the work that's required on them, and then what we've got to do to make them serviceable. Tonight's uh, numbers-wise, it's pretty typical. We've got seven aircraft. If we don't get them out on time, we might have cancellations, and that's a really bad place to be. But although we have this massive urgency to make sure we're delivering these aircraft so our customers fly, above all else, the aircraft have to be safe. So if our engineers aren't happy that the aircraft's not safe, we will cancel the the fly. Once the workload is locked down, the team need to make a plan for the night to make sure they prioritise which aircraft gets fixed and when. The first job, we have Tango November Delta, our brand new Neo, that's going to be coming into the hangar, so we're going to tow that one in. It's actually got a problem with one of its engines, and these engines are used to provide compressed air and to power the pneumatic systems on the aircraft. When they arrive in the hangar, each aircraft is allocated a licensed aircraft engineer, or LAE, who is responsible for diagnosing, overseeing and signing off all work done on that plane. There's been a fault message popped up, uh, so the crew have reported that, brought it into the hangar, and we're going to troubleshoot it tonight to find out what's wrong. With defects uh, and errors like this, it, it can come from multiple sources, so um, until we've got into that engine and having a look round, we, it, it could be anything. Luckily for the team, Ian has a hunch and heads straight to where he thinks the problem lies. The fault of, I think I've had before, uh, I believe to be this pipe here. Uh, so we're going to disconnect this pipe and leak check it and check there's no holes in it, which is what it's been in the past. And the quickest and most effective way of testing this pipe is surprisingly low tech. Just stick your finger on that. And then the best way to leak test it is just take your mouth around the end. there. So uh, as I run my hand down, you can feel the air coming out through the braided cable. Uh, there shouldn't be anything leaking out of here, so that will throw the message off to the computer. It'll sense less than it should be. So we'll replace this pipe, and that should fix it up. Now we've found the issue, uh, I'll go into the parts catalogue. It's a picture of every single item on the aircraft. Uh, we'll find a part number for that, that pipe, and we'll order a new one up. Hopefully we'll have one locally in stock. If we do, we'll get it quickly and fit it. And then we can run the engine and test if we get the fault back. If the pipe isn't available locally, the repair could be delayed. And while Ian contacts the parts department, Phil is conducting what's known as a daily, a 13-point visual inspection that every single aircraft undergoes every day. It's to try and prevent delays on the ramp. I mean, simple stuff like this. If it's all checked every day, then you don't have to worry about it during the operation. So just looking for any impact damage along the leading edge from any birds or things like that. You just get to know what to look for. So, I mean, instantly you can normally see if there's a dent or 
you know, you're looking at the shine on the on the paintwork, and you can see. And Phil's attention to detail has identified another problem. I checked the tyres for wear. This tyre's almost bald across here, so we'll be replacing that later on tonight. It's just wear and tear from the general, so every time it lands, it scrapes off the tyre. So again, he'll order it from the same stores. We keep the stock locally for this aircraft. Um, he'll order that, get a nice new one, and we'll sort of refit that. It's the whole wheel assembly that we change, rather than just the tyre. So we need to remove the whole wheel from the axle. And that means jacking up a 65-tonne plane. So to jack the plane up, just a glorified um, heavy-duty trolley jack, basically, which goes onto the bottom of the undercarriage leg. Simple as that. <laughs> So, with the tyre sorted, back at the engine, the new part has arrived. One pipe. Okay. So, Dom will now refit it, same position as it was, and then once finished, we'll close the engine back up and we can go test it. So, I'll just slide it in. You've got two points which is connected to this one in the top and one up here somewhere in the bottom. So, I'm just going to slave it in and then find which way the feet it would go properly. And with the new pipe fitted, it just remains for Ian to sign off. Yeah, so once Tom's finished, um, he's shown me what he's done. Uh, I've checked that over, so now I'm just having a quick check around. No tools have been left inside, there's nothing else wrong in the area, so it's just a peace of mind thing before we close the engine. We'll close it up. The only way to test this engine to see if we've cleared the seat is to start the engine. So this particular component needs air rushing through it, so that to get that, we need to start it. The only way of getting enough air through the new part is to run the engine at takeoff power and the team can't afford any setbacks. If this doesn't pass the test, we've got to go back to the drawing board a bit. This is critical. Back at Terminal 5, aircraft dispatch manager Sally Ann has a problem on her hands. With only three hours to go before the plane departs for Japan, she receives some last-minute information about a passenger. We have on board um, an unnotified uh, customer who actually needs to be lifted out of their seat and into a wheelchair. But when she arrives at the plane, it looks like the crew have sprung into action. Uh, oh, the gentleman's here. Yeah. You've managed. Okay, okay, okay let me go on. The gentleman's here, my darling. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, guys. Good morning. The crew have managed to. Um, bring the gentleman off in the iron chair that they have on the aircraft. So these guys will be able to just transfer the gentleman into his chair, thankfully. As soon as it's confirmed that all the passengers have disembarked, Sally Ann can board the plane and begin the process of getting it ready for its next flight. First job is to check there are no technical problems. Hi, guys. Any issues? Uh, not at the moment. Not, not at the moment. moment. Lobby team so, OK. Like just cabin maintenance. Fine. So. OK, cool. So what's going to happen next? Hopefully the cleaners will, will arrive. As you can see, it's been a nine-hour flight and uh, it does need a bit of swim cleaning, I think, really. It was an overnight flight, hence all the pillows, blankets all over the place. We have left to go now, um, one hour fifty. We have cleaners and on the other side we have caterers. And we have caterers here at the middle door as well. Already, cargo is being dropped at the rear of the aircraft. This is cargo for the outbound flight. Every year, the airline handles over half a million tonnes of cargo through its air freight business, carrying everything from life-saving medicine to family pets. On Sally Ann's flight to Tokyo today, the team have to deal with 5,000 kilos of cargo, including a consignment of fresh flowers, and that's on top of 3,700 kilos of luggage. With loading underway, Sally Ann turns her attention to making sure she has all of the 230 meals needed for this flight. The food is delivered fresh from the catering company and loaded onto the plane. These have got seals on, but it'll have... Just double check. Just seeing it. Flight number on it. I mean, I know it's been done. Yes, it has. Right now, that flight number's there. Okay. So I'm happy now that the caterers have been on. You can see here we've got 
catering if I can open up. Catering here. This all looks very fresh. So, with the food safely stowed away, Sally Ann now has to sign off on the cleaning before any passengers are allowed to board. It's all very quiet. This looks as if it's kind of ready to go. Looks good. It's all clean and it's all catered. So, um, that's good. That's very good. So, it's all waiting for crew and passengers. Back up at the gate, the boarding team are also getting ready for the arrival of passengers for flight BA5. Morning, everybody. <laughs> Afternoon, even. How are you? I'm well, thank right. you. Good. Today. Yes. New self boarding gates. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Cool. We've got the team. Uh, we've got customers. We've called the customers across. We're just setting up. Yep. And um, I'll wait for your call. I'll give you a call. Yep. Yeah, um, just in case we're not quite ready, but Absolutely. I'm anticipating we will be. But with less than an hour before the flight is due to leave for Tokyo, Sally Ann's list of jobs seems endless. I'm going to go down to our little pod downstairs. I'm going to prep the flight, print a load sheet out for the captain, um, hopefully catch up with the loading team, and hopefully we should have some cabin crew. At this stage, even the slightest glitch could put the whole schedule in jeopardy. And as ever, the clock is ticking. Just under an hour now, so it'll be all go from here on in, I think. Coming up. Will a vital engine test throw a spanner in the works for Neil? If there is a failed test, we could be put under real pressure then. Will the remote-controlled robots tow the line at Heathrow? Ah, oh, almost <laughs> made it. Almost. <laughs> and aircraft dispatch manager Sally Ann gets bogged down with paperwork. We need, please, some toilet rolls and some soap. There's no soap on board. In the fleet support unit, the team are in the middle of another busy night. There are seven aircraft in for overnight maintenance, and the airline needs as many as possible ready for the first wave of flights out of Heathrow in the morning. Our customers expect us to be punctual, and our entire flying programme is built around us operating on time. Um, so for us to be able to, to keep to those schedules, we've got to deliver a punctual operation, otherwise we haven't got enough resources. It's the early hours, and Neil and the team are managing to keep to their busy schedule but a call from the operations team is about to throw a spanner in the works. Oh, yeah, we'll see what we can do. All right. Uh, Keith, can you just go see the guys to see if we can get that Neo up a bit earlier? We just had, they've had a bit of an issue over at the terminal. So Steve just phoned us from Main Troll and said that there's, uh, there's an issue over in the terminals with one of the aircraft that he's dealing with at the moment. And he's asked if we can get an aircraft up sooner to cover the risk of this problem. Um, so we're basically just going to go and see if we can deliver the Neo earlier. If the problem with the faulty plane at Terminal 5 can't be resolved, there's a very real possibility that Neil will need to get the Neo ready to fly earlier than planned. And that means taking it straight to the engine test area, or as it's known, the run pen. The way this engine run pen's been built, but there's a large slope at the back, and that allows all the thrust that these engines produce to be diverted upwards and away safely without doing any damage. So Ian and his team, whilst he's carrying out this engine test, he's going to be looking at the instruments and particularly down the centre of the cockpit, there's a couple of screens that will indicate to the pilots any error messages that are on the aircraft. And so we're hoping that there's going to be no messages on there and that we've got a successful uh, test and that means we've got serviceable aircraft. If there is a failed test, we could be put under real pressure then because then there's a chance that we may not deliver for the morning flight. Um, so we really need this test to come good. It would take up to about 75 to 80 percent of its maximum power, which on these is around 25,000 pounds per inch. So it's quite high. Uh, aircraft will bounce around a little bit, but we'll have our feet firmly on the brakes. So turn all the fuel pumps on, dry the engines. Let's start for one. Uh, fill clear to stand number two. So we're going to sit on the brakes so the aircraft will move forward. It bounces around a bit, and the, the, the guy stood outside the brave man, trusting us not to pull the brakes. Right, come down. Back and break on, and brakes off. 
So that was around takeoff power. We had no faults. We would have got a message popping up in here. Nothing to worry about aircraft fix. It's fantastic. It's a great result for us. Keith? Uh, TTMD is serviceable ready for the morning. Yeah. Done. This is one down. We've got six to go. Over the next three hours, Neil and the team managed to shift another four planes off the casualty list. And this means you'll have some good news for the regular 3 a.m. callover with the rest of the airline's operations team. The three o'clock callover is critical. That's where the ops will determine what aircraft they've got to use for service. It's our point where we then deliver and say what we are confident that we will be producing at six that morning. Right, morning everybody. It's uh, Stephen Stew in Main Troll. Who's there from the FSU? Win the FSU. All right then, Neil. Give us a rundown of your aircraft, please. Okay. So the top uniform. Cup of whiskey. That'll be good for the morning. We had uniform, uniform golf. The airline operates around 140 short haul aircraft, 40 of which are based at Heathrow. But if one is out of commission, it's not necessarily as simple as swapping it with another available plane. We have five different types, and they're all different sizes, and they take different passenger loads. So in simple sense, if one of the larger aircraft doesn't come up, we may not have a, an aircraft with enough capacity for our passengers, and that's the sort of issue we would have. <coughs> Who's there from T5? Good morning, Steve. It's Bruce and another Steve. Good morning, Bruce. Any issues? Yes, we've got um, a couple of issues. Just a little concern, and I got there to Lima, chasing that up with the flight crew. During that call, you would have heard Bruce talking about his problem with Echo Delta Lima. Now, when I pick things up like that early in the evening, I look around for other opportunities and I recognise that Neil may have been able to produce his aircraft one and a half hours early. We've got Tango November Delta. This one... Uh, we've managed to bring forwards. Uh, it will be able to declare it at four this morning. So that will be good. All right. Thanks very much, everybody. Have a good morning. Yeah, so we just got off the uh, 0300 callover and we found out that we've got two casualties coming over. So we're into action stations, really, because the aircraft that we've got left to deliver tonight, they have to be delivered. So although the NEO is going to be delivered early, Neil and the team have got a lot more work to do yet. As part of the turnaround process here at Heathrow's Terminal 5, an army of remote-controlled robots are helping to reduce delays to short-haul departures. These have been used right across T5A building now, so uh, there's one of these on every stand. There's probably about 80 departures a day, uh, and each individual motorstock will do anywhere between 10 and 20 pushbacks on each stand. The pushback process is a vital part of getting planes into the air. As they have no reverse gear, aircraft need to be manoeuvred away from the gate, or pushed back, before they can use the power of their engines to move forward. Before the motor top was introduced, the dispatcher would call up for uh, an aircraft movement tug to push the aircraft back, but if that aircraft tug is engaged or delayed on another departure, obviously that's going to hold up the uh, operation. So, using these machines to assist with the short-haul departures frees up tugs for the larger aircraft but moving planes loaded with passengers and fuel is a high-stakes business. Today, trainee ramp supervisor Sarah is at Heathrow for her final training session before she attempts her first solo pushback on the 60-ton Airbus A319. Sarah's been on training with me now for seven days, and today's going to be the day where she gets to push an aircraft out without me walking beside her. I'm excited because, obviously, not everyone gets to push out a multi-million pound plane, you know? But nervous. It's a multi-million pound plane. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say it's quite a, a big moment, yeah, because they kind of rely on us to say left a bit, right a bit, and stop there, or watch out for this, or watch out for that. And basically, she's going to be on her own, so it's going to be a little bit scary for her. He's always been there, so once he leaves me, that's it. I'm in trouble. <laughs> Flight delays can be costly to an airline, and using these remote-controlled vehicles has reduced pushback-related delays by 70%. It's um, controlled by a remote control. Uh, obviously, you've got forward and backward control, and the right stick does the left and the right hand. But because it's designed to actually push the aircraft back, the controls are opposite. So if you want the motor top to go right, it actually goes left. So you've got to be mindful of, uh, of that. The area in the middle is the cradle area, which connects onto the aircraft nose wheel. It's got various hydraulics in there, um, which obviously open the cradle, which lower the cradle, uh, which operate the paddles which clamp down onto the top of the aircraft tyres. And it's obviously got hydraulics that lift the aircraft up as well. 
But before trainee Sarah can fly solo, she has to prove to instructor Martin that she can keep her cool under pressure by completing this dummy run. OK, Sarah, what I want you to do today is actually manoeuvre the motor top out of the parking bay and slalom round the two cones and park it in the opposite bay. OK. OK, okay let's yeah. go for it. Let's give it a try. Let's try it. Nice and slowly does it. Yep. The idea is, is to you know, use nice, slow inputs on the control sticks and then the motor top reacts in a nice, smooth manner and a much more controlled manner as well. OK? As soon as that's level with the cone, put the turn on. Well done. As close as you can get without touching it. I'm not touching that, am I? Did I touch it? That's it, and round you go. Oh. Ah. Run a little wide there, Sarah. <laughs> Oh, almost made it. <laughs> almost. Well done, Sarah. How do you feel after that? I'm getting there. <laughs> I'm picking it up. Going forward is a lot easier than going backwards. So far, so good. But has Sarah's confidence grown enough to do the same thing with a plane attached? Cones you can hit with a plane. There's no mistakes. Back at the departures gate, Sally Ann Ellis is in charge of getting flight BA5 ready to take off for Tokyo in less than an hour's time. I am looking to see if we have a slot. I'm looking to see how many flight crew we have. The cargo is loading, and the plane has been cleaned and restocked with food and water. So her next job is to make sure there is enough fuel on board for its 6,000-mile trip. 67 tonnes of fuel this is going to take, so... A fair amount. We're almost full. I think we've got two empty seats left at the moment. Um, that's about it, really. So I'm going to go upstairs. I'll see the fueler first. Um, I should go upstairs, check with the cabin crew, because we want to start boarding in about six minutes. So let's go. Hello. 67, please. Do you want that? I'll take it. Yeah. Might as well. Okay, all right. All I did, I confirmed the fuel figure with him. Now, he should have already picked it up on his iPad, but I just wanted to make sure, because sometimes you might find that he doesn't know or there's a discrepancy. So that's all I did. So he now knows he's got 67 tonnes to go on board. Now that the fuel load has been confirmed, Sally Ann heads back to the plane to meet the crew. We're going upstairs, catch the cabin crew, um, agree a time with them for boarding, which, as I say, should be very shortly. All of a sudden, it just starts to go, and more and more people start to appear. What's Eleven done? of us today. Eleven of you today, smashing. Yeah, and three flights, obviously. Eleven and three. Um, well, I think a bit. Uh, we need some more soap, please. Please, I've got any soap on in the okay. toilets and the toilet rolls. The toilet the rolls. Got the things, but uh, okay. Rolls. All right, my darling. No problem. Okay, we should start up there in two minutes. Sure. No problem. Will that yeah, be all right with I'm you? Sure I'll just check with the crew. Okay. And, um, I'll, I'll them give them a shout and I'll say well. a, yeah. a couple, yeah. a couple of minutes, sure and then we'll get going. So three and eleven. Okay. That's it. Cool. Thanks. Although the aircraft is now ready to start receiving passengers, Sally Ann's job is far from over. A couple of minutes, isn't it? Is it uh, six minutes past? Yeah, a couple of minutes and send them down, my lovely. That's great. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Right. I'm now going to go and see the flight crew. Hello, hi. Hi. How's it hi. Going? It's, it's looking good, actually. We're just about to start boarding. We've got all the freight out there. The loaders are here. Um, there's your load sheet. Uh, my number's on there should you need me. All right, I'll see you in a bit. OK, thanks. Perfect. Okay. I'm doing your toilet rolls Lovely. and your soap, soap now. OK, I'll go and release them to you. <laughs> Hello, it's Sally here. I'm on the 005, which is Bravo Kilo Romeo on 534. We need, please, some toilet rolls and some soap. There's no soap on board. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Sally Ann now needs to get back to the departure gate to check that the passengers have started to come through. Boarding is underway. We did start on time, 44 minutes before departure. So, it's looking good. But sometimes looks can be deceptive. 
I've just noticed we have one of our wheelchair passengers travelling today has their own wheelchair with them that will have to go in, down into the hold. So I'd rather like to get them here early so we can take it down and I can find out what kind of wheelchair it is. I'm assuming it's a manual, but never assume anything. It could, it could end up being, it could be an electric one, in which case we'll need to do some rearranging. Late passengers can cause serious problems for the airline. It's their policy to start offloading missing passengers' bags 12 minutes before departure. And if customers arrive once that process has started, they won't be able to fly. So it's vital Sally Ann tracks down her absent passenger. How are we doing, Harvey, with these wheelchair to gate? I just told him to make a call in the lounge, tell him to come here ASAP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope Is it just there. a manual wheelchair? It's not saying electric. We're trying to track the wheelchairs because if we get a wheelchair to the gate late and it needs to go into the hole, it does delay the loading. So we're going to try and get them, try and get them down here. I hope not too long. And as well as the missing wheelchair passenger, Sally Ann is also on the lookout for a further 48 passengers who haven't arrived yet. Will she be able to find them all in time, or will the flight have to be delayed? Coming up, will a last minute technical glitch cause chaos for Sally Ann? One of the machines that the loading team use has broken down, which will delay loading slightly. And is the night shift's luck about to take a turn for the worse? So, um,. Not quite how we had planned. On the other side of the airport, trainee ramp supervisor Sarah is about to fly solo for the very first time as she attempts to manoeuvre the Airbus A319 with a remote-controlled pushback vehicle. Sarah's every move will be assessed by instructor Martin Cox, who's been operating these machines since they were introduced to the airline in 2017. I was a bit sceptical at first, but uh, as soon as I got to use it, I was uh, quite, quite impressed with it, to be honest. And while Martin was also impressed by Sarah's performance as she navigated around the traffic cones, now he needs to be confident she can safely lift and manoeuvre an actual aircraft. I'm looking that she's um, not doing things too fast, she's taking her time, and that she's doing everything in a safe and controlled manner. The first stage is to attach it safely and securely to the aircraft's nose wheel. But I reckon that's one of the hardest parts, because if you remove it and it's not completely aligned, you can take the tyre with it. That part was done well. Let's see stage two. You keep your eye on the steering limitation marks. Yeah. Keep it nice and slow. OK. Away you go. Just correct it, so if the tail starts to go to the right, just steer to the left, and vice versa. OK. And um, once the uh, main wheels have crossed the double white lines, then they start to put a bit of right turn on to... OK. ..start the turn. It's on the line. It's on the line. She's got the nose wheel on the centre line, so she's, she's done really well there. With the aircraft in the right position, Sarah can breathe a sigh of relief. But what's the verdict on her performance? <laughs> Congratulations <laughs> on your first push, Sarah. Great job. It was good. I think I done really well. I'm proud of myself. Mine's proud. So I'm happy. I'm happy. Sarah's done really well. I'm really pleased. She's been listening to what I've been telling her. And she's taken it all on board. And, uh, yeah, she just demonstrated a perfect push there. So, big well done to you, Sarah. <laughs> Round you go. Less speed, more steering. He'll always be in my ear. Like, he, uh, he might not be there, but he will always be in my ear, you know? He's in my head now. He's in my head. <laughs> How did it feel doing it on your own? It's easy. <laughs> <laughs> Back at gate 34, aircraft dispatch manager Sally Ann Ellis is on the hunt for missing passengers. Um, we still have 52 passengers to board. And then a welcome sight. This is good news seeing all these people coming down now. But now it's not just absent passengers causing Sally Ann problems. How far are you into it all? Okay, thanks, bye-bye. 
There you go, you see, best laid plans. One of the machines that the loading team used has, has broken down, so they've had to go and get another one, which will delay loading slightly. But although there's a problem for the loading team outside, it looks like Sally Ann is having better luck at the gate. Hi there, how are you? Hi. Finally, she's located her missing passenger. Okay, you're right. Or has she? And this is Do 32. The, are you going on which flight? Seattle are you? 49. No, you're on the wrong flight, I'm afraid. But at the last moment. You're going to Narita? Yeah, oh, okay. Do you want to come straight round here? Please, that's great. The first customer was for the wrong flight. They've just got married. They're going on a month holiday, including cruises, and going to Japan and Russia. So it's nice to see you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. With boarding complete, have the cargo team finished loading in spite of their faulty kit? They're just finishing off, so I'm happy with that. And with that good news, it's back up to the plane to confirm everything with the crew. It's a lot of up and down. And me with a bad back as well, but it's all right. <laughs> Did you get your soap and you got a soap? Perfect. Lovely. Lovely. Thank Lovely. You. Thanks ever so much. Have a good trip, yeah. you? See you soon. Yeah. Nice to do business. Thanks. Bye-bye. Yeah. Right, right, that's that. Let's get this off. Finally, after one last visual inspection, flight BA5 to Tokyo leaves the gate right on schedule. It has been a good team effort. You know, everyone's done a smashing job, and you can't ask more that than that, really, can you? So, uh, good day. In the fleet support unit, the overnight shift is drawing to a close. The team have had a successful night delivering six planes back to the airline. The last aircraft on the casualty list is Uniform Oscar Golf. Andy and his team are, are looking at number one engine over here. It's got high oil consumption, so we're trying to find an oil leak with it. We found one earlier, our day shift found an oil leak. We take the spinner off, that was leaking under there, so they've changed the seal in there, that's cured it. As a follow-up, we have to do uh, an internal inspection using our boroscope equipment. So our boroscope's a fibre optic camera with a lens on the end so it can go inside a hole, a boroscope point in the engine and we can see inside the engine, see the blades internally in the engine without having to pull it all apart. So through the bleed port I can get access to the LP compressor which is the front section of the engine. I'm trying to get to the bottom of the blade and then see if there's any oil. Right, so this, this is the LP compressor, the very tip of it and then we're just seeing to make sure it's clean, as you can see it's very clear, very clean and make sure there's no oil deposits on this and this is a good one. So Alex, are you ready to turn? Yeah. So just turn very slowly just for now. Right there we go and you can see the LP compressor turning around and then we just check all the blades nice and slowly and we're looking for like an oily run on the tips. But this is dry, this is clean, this is good. Yeah it looks good Alex, thank you. That's that, that's all good. So, with the oil leak repaired and after a thorough internal inspection, the obligatory engine test seems like a mere formality. But when the results come back, the news is disappointing. Uh, we've still got a leak and it's come back in for further investigation. OK, OK. So, um, not quite how we had planned, but we're... Um, we're uh, safety's first. We've got to make sure the aircraft's safe, so... You know, Andy's got to be happy with, to sign it off, so we've got to do a bit more investigation. Luckily enough, because we've delivered so many other aircraft tonight, the operation's not affected. So this is this is just us. We wanted all, all seven. So uh, it looks like it may only be six, but still, still a good result. It's now up to Neil to let the ops control team know that there'll be one plane short in the morning. Uh, the LAE on Uniform Oscar Golf just informed us that the engine has failed its runs. So it's going to have to come back. We were straight on the phone to Ops and to Main Troll to say um, UOG is not going to make it this morning, and so they were aware. But we did have three standby aircraft. So with this one um, failing its test, it's dropped us down to two standby aircraft. So we've still got a large safety margin within the uh, operation today. So while the night shift might have ended in disappointment, with six out of seven faulty aircraft out of the hangar and safely back in service, it's not surprising that Neil is proud of his team's performance.
The Neo was a great result. The team did brilliantly on it. We got a really early find on it. They worked quickly, efficiently and safely and they got a superb result. And it actually turned out that the operation really needed that aircraft. And so having that early result meant that we could offer it back sooner to make sure that there was no services uncovered this morning. I'm done. But then, do it all again tonight. Next time on Inside British Airways, will the arrival of the airline's first new type of plane in six years have a bumpy landing? That's going to be a bit of a challenge. Their design team, their engineering need to assess and, and come up with a, a design solution for that. There's turbulence ahead as the flight crew get to grips with a new simulator. Go around. Wind here ahead. Wind here to go. And the airline's HQ prepares for a royal flying visit. The Queen is in the building, ladies and gents. We have a turquoise outfit, which I think 